good afternoon, uh, barely, uh, or good morning or good evening, depending upon where you are, but welcome to uh, today's joint session of the Energy Policy Seminar at the Belfer Center and the Solar Geoengineering Policy Seminar at the Mosavar Romani Center at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Wake Smith and I'm the host today uh, of a session titled Space-Based Solar Geoengineering and Astropolitics. Our format today is going to be the format of the Solar Geo Policy Seminar, which is to say we're going to have two speakers give brief uh, talks to set up our subject, and then a uh, conversant to further the discussion. And we hope to leave a lot of time for cross-discussion amongst our panelists and Q&A uh, from the audience. We're joined today by Oliver Morton, uh, who needs little introduction as the briefings editor of The Economist. Uh, Oliver has written several books on uh, celestial topics, including Eating the Sun, Mapping Mars, and most recently, The Moon. But he's also the author of The Planet Remade, one of the two books that I think is really uh, forms the, the canon uh, of books related to solar geoengineering. We were gonna be joined today by Pete Warden, the former director of NASA's Ames Research Center, but Pete had the bad judgment to prioritize a change in a space launch over being here with us today. Uh, and uh, uh, so we uh, are joined by the author of the other great book uh, in this field, uh, David Keith, who needs even less introduction here. Um, but his uh, uh, 2013 book, A Case for Climate Engineering, uh, helped introduce this topic to the world. Uh, we're joined as a discussant by Matt Weinzerl, a professor uh, at Harvard Business School and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, Pete uh, had former positions uh, on the President's Council of Economic Advisors and at McKinsey, but is a particular specialist in emerging technologies and solar geo in particular. And so without uh, further ado, other than to say that we will use for questions the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, uh, I'm going to hand things over to Oliver. Thank you very much, Wake. It, <clears throat> it's very nice to be, to, to be here with all of you and uh, thinking about something a little less troubling than most of, what, of mo most of the world's uh, affairs at the moment. Not that climate change isn't troubling, but I think that there's one of the, the something that's interesting about space-based approaches to geoengineering is, and I hope this comes out in our discussion, as well as being a possible not yet emergent emergent technology, um, it's also, uh, as I used to think about geoengineering more broadly, it's a very useful way of looking at what you think and trying to decide what really matters about the things that you're approaching. And I think somehow, sometimes when we deal with the more near term possibilities for geoengineering or not geoengineering the planet, we have a tendency perhaps to get bogged down in the, in the very specifics of those. And one of the interesting things about the non-specific, non-boggy nature of the discussion of space-based geoengineering um, is that it doesn't really permit you permit that. So you can look at it, it, allow, it, it allows you to take a sort of like a step back as you were, as it were. And um, here, for example, we see the step back in process. Where is the, there, can you? Mm. You were seeing your slideshow now, Oliver. There we go. And so here is the gentleman taking a step back. And uh, although here we are just um, uh, illustrating the Archimedean principle, um, you could also imagine that if that chap is throwing a shadow, then that's basically what we're talking about here today. We are talking about putting things into space, either from the surface of the Earth, from the asteroid belt, from the surface of the moon, that would occlude, diffuse, reflect, or otherwise thwart the passage of sunlight from the sun to the Earth. Um, Interestingly, this idea, uh, ideas of solar geoengineering of blotting out the sun a bit um, start to become uh, important ideas in the 1970s, arguably. At that time though, um, this diagram, um, which gives a good sense of the, of the sort of thing we're talking about, 
from a book in the 1970s. This is in fact uh, an example of uh, the approach of solar-based terraforming to the planet Venus. This is from uh, James Oberg's classic book, uh, New Worlds, one of the first ever, I think, book on terraforming um, uh, as, as, as an independent subject. And I think one of the things that's interesting about seeing this coming, as it were, towards the Earth from the astro, astro engineering concepts of terraforming is that one of those big questions that we can lose slightly in our more focused discussions is the link between a truly cosmic way of looking at the Earth, um, which looks at it from outside, and a way of looking at the Earth from the inside um, as a process, as a world in which we're already taking part. Um, and that apart from being um, a, a distinction, a tension that's fairly central to what I find interesting about the world and indeed the planet and what I write about, uh, I think it's a very crucial thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about large scale technological imaginaries applied to um, the planetary system as a whole. And, you know, it's not, this is not a new thing. The people who first start, start talking about the Earth as a system and in the context of, um, climate change, we would think, of course, as Fante Arrhenius. These are people who are looking at the level of the planet, at theories of what it is to be a planet, a habitable planet. And engineering at that scale is the sort of thing we're talking about today. Now, um, I threw these slides together quite quickly, and I have not put together a way of knowing what order they're going to come in, but they should probably come in an order that more or less makes sense to the discussion. Yes, here is a way of blocking out some sunshine from the Earth. This one was actually discussed a little bit before the 1970s, putting a ring around the Earth. Um, I mention it mainly because the picture's pretty, um, but also because although it's uh, to some extent um, a reductio ad absurdum, it does rather um, highlight the problems with any approach to this that might involve low Earth orbit or medium Earth orbit. You really don't want to be filling up the Earth's orbit with um, junk. Uh, and although we are, of course, doing that in some ways, doing it deliberately on a massive scale, leaving aside all other considerations, must rate as, as a bad thing, though not necessarily entirely without any um, aesthetic um, uh, charms. The other problem, of course, is that uh, the what you tend to do with um, these sorts of situation, with these sorts of arrangement is not shade the sunny parts of the planet. You tend to shade the winter pole and things like that. And that's not particularly helpful. So we will regretfully move on and move to this question. This is the uh, question of the, the point between the earth and the sun, the so-called L1 point, the first point of Lagrangian stability, which is uh, a pseudo location um, where an object will more or less, waving hands a little bit, with a little bit of help from its friends, stay in that pseudo location even as the Earth moves around. So it will stay <coughs> permanently um, balanced, as it were, between the Earth and the Sun. It will in fact wobble a bit, not least because the Earth will wobble a bit. Um, but that is an air place which obviously is particularly um, intriguing from the point of view of uh, a solar geoengineering approach that tries to get rid of some sunlight, because all of it would be in sunshine all the time. You don't have any wasted mass or very little wasted mass that, uh, that is up there, but not at any given moment between the Earth and the sun. If you put it into um, geostationary orbit or low Earth orbit, for quite a long time, any object would be shading things that weren't on the surface of the Earth. Here, all the shade to all the Earth, or alternatively, if you diffuse things away, all the diffusion away from the Earth. And so in terms of getting the most for your mass, it seems quite clear, um, and this was a conclusion that I, I can hardly say we reached at a workshop that we held on this in Harvard a couple of years ago, um, this is really where the game is played. Um, in terms of being able to block off large parts of large amounts of sunlight, you need large state slash country sized um, obstacles to sunlight at the L1 point. Um, 
And this is one example of how that might be done. This is um, a, from a study by Roger Angel in 2006 in PNAS, which is uh, one of the sort of like landmark studies in this area. Um, Angel imagined, I think around a trillion free floating little diffusers out at that, out at L1, in a cloud which would diffuse sunshine away from the earth at roughly speaking 1% of the solar constant. And the problem with this, as you will have noticed, is in the term trillions. Um, what it, however you do this, this is, a, this is a table from a recent paper um, by two Luxembourgers, or two people at least based in Luxembourg. Um, the real problem with this is that the amounts of mass involved are unbelievably large compared to any existing space program. And even and these numbers, um, I wouldn't necessarily, um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, tie my tie myself to their mast, but they're probably indicative. And you will notice that the number of launches per year is in the tens of thousands, coming down to the most um, uh, the most sophisticated system, uh, which is a very technologically daring, shall we say, system at 400 Starship launches a year for 10 years, so 4,000 Starship launches. The Starship, uh, which I haven't included a picture of because frankly it gets far too many pictures, though it is very pretty. Um, the Starship is the large scale ultra heavy launch vehicle being developed by SpaceX, uh, which will put on the order of 100 tons into low Earth orbit and purports to do so on a fully reusable basis when it's actually operating. It allows things to be done in space on a scale that has not previously been possible, um, although rather it will, if it works, allow that. Um, Elon Musk believes that it would be the first stage towards um, a system for, uh, it would be a stage for uh, establishing a prime, primary human presence on the planet Mars, though I think he's beginning to think slightly differently about long-term uh, transport to Mars. Um, it's also being um, looked at for the return to the moon. It's also, in the nearest term, being looked at for launching um, the second tranche of SpaceX's Starlink communication satellite system. Starlink, in any context other than discuss discussions of space-based solar geoengineering, is an extraordinarily ambitious program, um, which, and in the second phase, would see something like 30,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, um, but at around 400 satellites a launch, the Starlink, that would be about 75 launches. Now, that is the most extraordinary um, uh, project that anyone's actually trying to do in space, and it's still an order of magnitude below the ambition of the least ambitious, in terms of launch costs, option for um, space-based solar geoengineering. So Oliver, even let me let me just break in and note you've got another five minutes or so left. Although if you need, no, more I time, probably I, I may what that's that's very kind of you, Wake. Um, <clears throat> I uh, that doesn't, of course, mean uh, we, we're used to the idea that space capabilities are growing very quickly, but um, this this challenge is one far beyond what we're already thinking of with the Starship system, which is already um, uh, marks possibly the biggest step change in orbital capabilities. Um, well, possibly, well, maybe since the Saturn V, maybe since the space shuttle, but does the space shuttle count if it's not still there? I don't know. That may be a, a more philosophical question. So going on from the, so these things can all be made different. These numbers can all be made different if you start making things on the moon, but then you have to have the time and effort of setting up a moon base and you get into the sort of imaginary that Mr. Musk's rival, Mr. Bezos, thinks about where you are building a space-based civilization that can have millions of people um, living and working off earth. Again, it, it's interesting that technologically sophisticated uh, and uh, people with 
demonstrated business acumen are talking like this, that doesn't actually mean that it's very much that it's a near term likelihood, but it also means that one would be foolish to absolutely rule it out. So a couple of the general thoughts that I take away from this uh, in terms of how it makes you think about solar geoengineering in general. One of the criticisms made of um, solar geoengineering on a, with stratospheric aerosols, stratospheric aerosol injection, in which you put a cloud of very small particles in the stratosphere where they have a residence time of a year or so, and you thus block out sunlight, this worries people because uh, in, it, it is in, I can't remember whose terms, alarmingly cheap. Um, that's only true if you look only at the technical part of the project and don't look at all the other things that you would have to do to make that safe, just and governable. Um, but this is definitely a criticism of solar geoengineering that no one will in any, in any, at any time this century point at space-based solar geoengineering. It will never be alarmingly cheap. It will thus always be an elite game. Um, there is only there are generously two countries on earth that might even conceivably think about doing this in a 30 to 50 year time frame. Um, whereas <coughs> stratospheric aerosol interjection would be, uh, there are dozens of countries on earth that might think about that. You might think that this um, allows a certain stability of given that for some of us, including myself, the risks of solar geoengineering as achieved through stratospheric aerosols are largely, are. Uh, uh, at least as largely geopolitical as geophysical. However, one of the things you must remember about space-based solar geoengineering is that it in no way precludes stratospheric solar geoengineering. And if we look at the work that Marty Weissman um, pioneered and that Gernot Watt Wagner took on on the free driver issue, if you don't like the amount of solar geoengineering that a space-based system is providing you, you will still be able to add to it with strat stratospheric aerosols. So this ratcheting in which one ends up getting the highest level of solar geoengineering that anyone who um, can impose their will desires, that doesn't go away just because you have a central and perhaps sensible amount of geoengineering from a space-based system. Another point that you can take for good or ill um, is that you get very, very little sense of any regional control, at least of any first generation um, space based uh, system. And notice how even in the face of such enormity, we have this normalizing way of saying, oh, a first generation space based solar geoengineering system, but a second, third generation one. Um, yes. This is the this is one of the delights and traps of this sort of technological speculation. Um, so you won't be able to uh, even attempt at sort of like regional fine tuning or control. Now that could be a positive or a negative. You could say that, as with being very expensive, limiting the attractions for various other users or other purposes, other uses. <laughs> might actually be something to, um, uh, to recommend a space-based approach. Again, though, a space-based approach does not rule out people doing other things at regional and global levels underneath its umbrella. The one thing which I think um, is really uh, nice to take away from discussions of space-based approaches um, is that they, what they do have that no other system has is they have a clear legal basis on which I, under which I think many people would feel comfortable moving forward with um, discussions of solar geoengineering, at least far more comfortable than they do today. Any project such as the ones we're describing um, would come under the purview of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which says quite clearly that activities in outer space, whoever does them must be for the common benefit of humankind. Um, and that's just sort of like the, the floor for space stuff. And it may not be much, but actually having uh, an, inter an agreed international law saying you have to do this for everybody already out there, seems to me the one uncontested advantage um, that space-based geoengineering techniques might have. Might have. 
But again, they do not rule out other space, other geoengineering techniques undertaken at regional and uh, global levels. So I'm going to leave the introduction there and pass on to David. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much. So, so first of all, to say the obvious, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> impossible for me to fill Pete Warden's very large shoes, and just to uh, um, just to, to to amplify for the audience how true that is, Pete has had two overlapping important roles in this. He was the convener of a meeting in NASA Ames in 06, if I'm remembering correctly, which was really a pivotal meeting and kind of launching the modern version of the solar geoengineering uh, science and policy discourse. Um, and he's also been a, a leader in the kind of public policy and, and entrepreneurial policy around kind of new space uh, technologies. Um, and, and so those two things together make him perfect. So um, I'm a stand in at last minute and I will do my best. Um, I guess, let me start by saying everything about space-based solar geoengineering feels utterly different from the conversations about its Earth-based cousin. Starting where Oliver just left off, there's a fundamental difference in the way to think about governance. This outer space treaty uh, really does have some really quite beautiful and, and moving language uh, uh, and, and, and provides a framework for how governance might evolve and a framework that would carry a fair amount of weight. It doesn't guarantee anything, but I think that means you're starting from a different place. And any version of space-based solar geoengineering has a central role for what is presumably a gigantic new private industry, which utterly changes it from the way we think about most versions of terrestrial solar geoengineering, where it looks like you, you, you don't require and you wouldn't want some major new industry. There'd be some new technologies to develop, and but they would presumably be done mostly with sovereign, uh, uh, in response to demands of sovereign nations that contracted for services. But what would be built as infrastructure to implement terrestrial solar geoengineering, at least in most of the ways we think about it, really looks like a very small industrial activity. Um, and so in that sense, it's, in those two senses, it's utterly different. Um, there are a couple sort of framing ways, amplifying some of what Oliver said, that I see this story. First, it's just utterly outside what humanity has done in space today. Um, as Oliver nicely put it, Starlink, which of course is still not completed, but at this point is on pathway to be complete is um, by far the, in some sense, the biggest thing that's been done, certainly in terms of total launch mass and number of, of, of satellites. Uh, but Starlink is still in order or two, depending on how you think about it, uh, order of two, order of magnitude or two smaller than this scale. So it's just beyond what any capacity that we have now, which means any strong claims about what's hard or easy are just extraordinarily speculative in a way that is not true for um, uh, um, terrestrial solar geoengineering, where speculation about governance is, is difficult, very hard to know what will happen or, or, or even to articulate clean versions of what should happen. But um, the technological and scientific understandings are actually reasonably well developed. So to say a little bit about as I see some of the uh, a two by two matrix of how this would actually be done. I think there are two basic technical pathways to do it and two basic categories of locations. So the two categories of locations are low earth orbit and, and, and L1 or the L1 uh, environment. It's not actually at L1. And um, the two basic pathways are more or less to spend manufacturing, immense manufacturing money on earth to make extremely lightweight, extremely mass efficient structures, building them on earth, uh, uh, and then launching all their mass into space where they then maneuver their way to L1 or whatever. Uh, so that's the uh, 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 high launch mass and high uh, sophistication of the structure approach. And the other approach is that you fundamentally launch a machine, obviously not a single machine, but a set of machines that builds a capability to go build this thing in space out of outer space resources from the moon or from asteroids or whatever. And then again, there's a bit of a separate split there where if you assume it's being built in in-space resources, 
there's a, a broadly a trade-off in ideas between a kind of large amounts of dumb mass and smaller amounts of smart mass, where you can imagine uh, uh, shepherding or moving asteroids uh, uh, um, where you then make fine dust out of them that isn't uh, very mass efficient as a scatterer, and you rely on the fact that it's, in this hypothetical, relatively cheap to move that mass around, or you actually manufacture in space something that's a relatively efficient uh, shield. Um, what I think is a reasonably clear result, or at least you know, was con confirmed in that meeting that we held, is that it's really hard to see that an L1 system could make sense. The environmental impacts, as well as the risks, as well as the visual impacts are all so large that it seems to me very implausible that it would make sense. I think the, um, the that's sorry, of, of the low Earth orbit system. A um, L1 system, I think, uh, it, it is therefore the only, I don't know, plausible is too strong because it's so hard to say anything with confidence about these technological capabilities we don't have yet. But I think it, it you can close to say that if there's any version of this that makes sense, it's only the L1 version. Um, I think we have no idea uh, how to think seriously about uh, uh, the trade-off between the make a very efficient shield and launch all that shield versus make a bunch of robots and machinery that goes to build something in space. But I do think we can say something about total launch cost, and it's worth saying something that puts that in perspective. And the thing we can say is, is that it is not utterly ridiculous to do this in a budget that's consistent with the kinds of money that people are spending or expect to spend for climate protection. So if you assume that the launch mass is based on a bunch of different studies, certainly physically possible, between say three and 10,000 tons, very round numbers. And if you assume that the cost per ton is getting down to a million dollars per ton, which it feels like we could get to quite quickly or, or below that, I'm quite skeptical about these $50 a kilogram <laughs> costs. Uh, I think there's some kind of, despite the enormous impressive uh, work of SpaceX, I think there's some kind of <clears throat> a nonsense about making it just as cheap as commercial air travel, but maybe I'm just not imagining enough. But even if you just assume that the costs get down into something that's a little bit under a million dollars a ton, which feels quite doable, just by really quite simple scaling of, 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 of where the, the market is evolving now, then you multiply those two numbers and you get numbers of order of one to 10 trillion. And, and the central point is that even if you're talking 10 trillion and you build it out over 30 years, you're, and you're thinking about doing this kind of mid-century, you're at under uh, 1%, significantly under 1% uh, 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 of GDP per year. And that's small compared to the uh, estimates of climate damages and small to what would need to be spent anyway to restrain emissions. So in that sense, you can say one very general, but I think important thing, which is just on a pure economic basis, uh, 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 versions of this that, that don't involve really wild assumptions about extremely cheap launches or unbelievably efficient structures or the ability to launch us a light mass and have the robots do everything else in space. Assumptions that are more conservative than that get you um, costs that are not on the face of it ridiculous. It's costs that might in a pure kind of uh, uh, cost benefit sense from a, a, a benign uh, a, a global civilization, which obviously isn't the one we live in, uh, 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 it, it is, you can't rule out the idea or you can say that, that basically it, it could be affordable. I think that's really an important point to make based on what we know now. Um, I think one, one remaining thought that I'll add before the conversation starts that I think Oliver didn't say as explicitly is the fact that um, any version of doing this any future in which this happens, it seems to me is for certain coupled with a future where there are other, other very large scale industrial activities in space are possible. And so in thinking about a future world where this is possible, you have to think about the correlation of that world and, and what other things are true in a world where we can do these kind of very large um, industrial activities in space. So presumably in space, manufacturing, uh, which could 
alter environmental footprints on Earth, in principle, making them smaller, but obviously lots of ways that it should make them bigger. Uh, space solar power, in space colonies, whether they're in low Earth or on Mars or where have you, uh, whatever you believe about which of those things is more or less likely, what I think is inescapable is a world that is able to build a substantial size L1 shield for uh, 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 solar geoengineering is also a world that is able to do large scale industrial activities in space that will change uh, uh, the way humanity sees itself and change the, the way the planetary economy and, and policy works in ways that we can't really guess. Maybe I'll leave it there, turn over to Matthew and look forward to a conversation. Thank you for letting me be a poor stand-in for Pete. Matt? Great, thanks so much, Wake, and thanks to everybody for allowing me to pitch in here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you talking about space, uh, which is a deep interest of mine. I should just note for those of you who know me and were surprised by Wake's generous introduction, which also called me an expert on the emerging technology of space solar geoengineering. I am not an expert by any means on the technology of it, but I appreciate the upgrade uh, and I'll do my best uh, to give a perspective maybe from the business and economics of space side. Well, just a couple of the thoughts. So I was taking notes uh, about what Oliver and David said. I, I wanna just start with something Oliver said on the value of seeing earth from a slightly different perspective. Uh, through this conversation, which I, I just want to echo so strongly, because for me, that's one of the very most rewarding things about what's happening in the space sector, is it gives us an opportunity more broadly to see some of the challenges we have on Earth uh, in a different light. Uh, and in particular, in a light where, at least in some cases, we can erase some of the historical baggage that we have and complications that we have on Earth. When you think about new settlements on Mars, you can try to think about them almost like as a blank sheet. Uh, and one thing we haven't talked very much about today is the actual astropolitics of all this, which is in the title of our meeting. And I think that we should make sure we engage with that in the next half hour, because unfortunately, once we talk about climate change and space-based solar engineering, solar geoengineering, I think the astropolitics do come back in, right? And how would we actually wrestle with the fact that these are, this is going to have to be managed through existing international relationships, uh, obviously, which are very challenging these days and which maybe our progress on climate change uh, is not particularly encouraging about. Uh, the second point I just wanted to mention was uh, on the, the actual technology of it. And I just, I really wanna echo a couple things that were said. So the changes have been incredible in the launch sector. And there's, as I think as David said about the costs, we can actually, you know, not ridiculously start talking about whether it's possible to launch something like this. But I was glad that he went to space-based manufacturing in his comments because when I imagine where this would head, and if we're talking about the horizon of you know, many decades away from it, uh, then it really seems to me like that's the scenario we're probably imagining. Even right now, some of you may know there's this company uh, that was originally made in space, now it's part of Redwire, which has this $70 million contract with NASA to build these solar panels in space uh, in a satellite or from a satellite. And that's just the very, very beginnings of this idea that we're gonna start making stuff up there rather than down here and sending it up. If you're talking about a trillion uh, objects at L1, it seems like manufacturing them in space would be where we would end up. And that really could dramatically change the economics of all this. And very much as David said, I was writing in fact exactly this, this would all I think be part of a huge expansion of activities in space. That's almost the only way to imagine us being able to do this, much as we would be in some sense trying to control a bit the Earth's climate we would probably be doing the same types of things to Mars by that point, if we really have this kind of capability. Uh, and that's an incredibly exciting and speculative future, but feels to me like that's probably where we would head so that our numbers that we calculate today are probably pretty rough at best. Um, on the, the third point I wrote down was on the OST, the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, I love the optimism that it would give us the way to coordinate. <laughs> I think we, maybe we can talk about that some more. I guess I'm not quite as optimistic in the sense that it feels like it hasn't been tested all that much. Um, and we're about to start testing it with the return to the moon and various economic activities there. You know, the US passed a law on asteroid mining back in 2015. Again, that hasn't really been tested, how that's gonna play out because no one's actually mined any asteroids yet. Um, so I think needless to say, there's still a lot to be figured out whether to 
that the international cooperation would work. Uh, and then I guess just the final note that I wrote down was on the last point David made about costs not being totally ridiculous. It's interesting, actually, the board behind me is from a class I taught on SpaceX and will it actually end up going to Mars and settling uh, Mars, as it said. And I think that it is important to keep in mind the long horizon over which costs like this would be spread and, and what we're talking about there, but also that we shouldn't think of this money being spent as consumption in the sense of you know, uh, the same as me buying a Coke Zero or something. As David pointed out, this would be investment in, you know, potentially quite uh, innovative technologies that could increase productivity more broadly. And so if we think that there's, you know, returns to capital intensive investments like that, uh, we, we might want to position it a little more positively than just, wow, this is a ton of money we have to throw out into outer space for a waste. So I'll stop there and look forward to the compensation and, and the Q&A. Um, Oliver or David, any any comments on uh, Matt's comments, or shall I commence with some questions from uh, the audience? I'm good for audience questions, and there's a couple pertinent ones in the Q and A. I probably responded to. Uh, uh, well, so uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q and A that go to the business model by which this might be done. And um, Matt, that may sound up your alley, but I think it's it's a question for everyone. Uh, how might this be funded, even if it is quite cheap relative to other climate um, uh, uh, solutions or interventions? And uh, specifically, is there some way to charge for shade, or is that not the way to think of the business model? Mm, boy, well, okay, so. My gut instinct on this is that this is a public good that we're gonna be funding probably not through uh, any sort of fees uh, in, a, in a private business sense, but through taxation. Uh, and I think, I think it was Oliver who said there's maybe two countries that could imagine doing this. And I, it, it does seem to me like that's the likely way you would end up paying for this is the largest economies of the world deciding that it's in their self-interest to make sure that this gets solved. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, but uh, I'm <clears throat> in the sort of uh, <clears throat> picture that David was drawing and well, as well of um, a world in which this is part of a greater investment in off planet activity. Much of that off planet activity might or might be claimed to be about to be profitable. Um, but uh, but I don't think that uh, at the moment, I think that a lot of it will be actually, I mean, at the moment, we're seeing a lot of it done on a very, very speculative basis. Um, and I think that the creation of um, super empowered individuals um, with assets in the hundreds of billions and an interest in these things is going to, um, it's going to be quite dominant for some time. Um, I don't think anyone's going to make as much money in space as um, Jeff Bezos has made on Earth for a very long time, and that includes Jeff Bezos. Um, there's a, an intriguing uh, science fiction book, which indeed has a structure at L1 in it, though a slightly different one, by Will McCarthy uh, that came out a couple of years ago. And I warn you, it has a dreadful cover, um, but has some nice ideas in it called Rich Man's Sky. And I think Rich Man's Sky is quite a good model for quite a lot of what's going on in the next uh, in the in the next few decades. The only thing I'd say is to think a little bit about the intermediate future. So we've been leaping to the the, the far future when there is some giant industry is capable of doing this and asking the question of uh, what's the, the the model for paying for for the large shield. But I think the interesting question is. Let's say this becomes a serious part of simply development of, of, of space technologies over the next decades, which means that some money from either super empowered individuals or governments uh, uh, is directed towards research on the idea of doing this, not implementing it, but uh, 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 developing uh, some of the abilities to make specific kinds of shields or robots that can do some parts of this. If that becomes part of the, the, the way outer space technologies develop uh, uh, um, in the next decades, that changes the story in ways that I think are hard to foresee. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chip in real quickly on that. I think there is 
you know, quite a lot of private capital right now going into space startups and not a huge amount of that into space manufacturing, but also not a trivial one. Yep. Uh, and to the extent that the private sector helps get us up the, or down the learning curve, uh, down the cost curve on doing manufacturing of various elements in space that will all be useful for making this possible in the long run. I'm interested, what do you see as non-trivial? Oh, <laughs> in terms of the amount of money flowing to these yeah. companies? So, you know, if you look at companies like Varda, just getting in the tens of millions, right, to figure out how to do some manufacturing on satellites. I mean, again, that's nothing like what you would need to build something like this, but to learn how to build things in space, you know, that's money that gives the company enough to actually try and do some activity. So just to pick up on that one, I would classify 10 million as more like trivial for space. I said that that's, we don't have a good definition, so I'm not trying to push that. Right. But here's a thought. If there was a serious uh, solar geoengineering research effort, as many of them advocated, and you know, with different countries involved, and its total budget was a, went to a few hundred million a year, which is quite plausible in the context of your solar energy research, a relatively small amount of that going to space-based could actually be significant in terms of developing some of these manufacturing things as a flow of government money, which is a, very different than the flows into launchers or the flows of money into, into LEO uh, satellite constellations, which are much larger. But if I were just to sort of like in the in the uh, metaphor of our uh, dear departed friend Bruce Murray, if I were to pull on the black boxing trunks um, and throw myself into the ring as the bad guy, um, what would you? Why would you want to do this even if you could? What to you would be the great advantage? Since it doesn't in any way preclude many of the things that we worry about with other forms of geoengineering. Uh -oh. I'll jump in there and also make one technical point. So, so I think the bottom line is that the more we've looked at aerosols, some of the risks that people thought about don't actually seem so big with the current science, which may be wrong. So the relative advantages of, or I should say what certainly is wrong, we should know how wrong it is. So the advantages of space-based solar geo were to me by no means clear cut. And there are all these disadvantages actually in terms of, of short-term stability. And let me get to that. So several questions in the queue asked about active control in L1. So just to state the sort of technological basics, L1 is a, is a dynamic saddle point gravitational, even if you're just a passive gravitational object. If you're an object with a strong light pressure, you're only there because of dynamic control. So whether you're one big shield or a bunch of little shields, uh, you're there by a dynamic balancing control, like somebody balancing on top of a pole. And so if you turn that off, or if there's a software hack that turns it off or an attack, you drift out of L1 pretty quickly. If it's a very lightweight thing, quickly means days. Uh, um, for heavier dust clouds, it's longer. Um, uh, one of the things in the chat mentioned that dust clouds aren't manipulable. That's not correct. I think there are at least ideas about doing it with electrostatic forces and there's gravitational shepherding. But I think the point is all of the potential methods for maintaining whatever it is, whether it's the smart low mass thing or the dumb high mass thing at L1, it's fundamentally dynamically unstable. And that has consequences. It means that uh, there's a way in which uh, uh, the, the termination shock that people worry about for uh, uh, um, uh, terrestrial solar geometry is in some ways more acute here because of that dynamic instability. Uh, that's it. Um, a, a question has arisen about the time horizon uh, that we would imagine for uh, such a space-based system. And, and I'll add to that, is there the prospect that it may take so long for such a system to be developed that it will no longer be relevant to the problem of climate change? I'll, I'll jump in for a second and say that the question of, I, I think that one way to think about solar geoengineering is it's supplemental to whatever we do about emissions cuts and carbon removal. And they use solar geoengineering during a period of high concentrations, we argue about what high means. And depending on what you think about carbon removal, that period is sort of of order a century, which means to be more than half a century and less than two centuries. And if you're thinking about that time scale then for solar geoengineering, I think that well, it seems likely that if you start in the next half century, you definitely do not start with a space-based system. You start with something else. That that time scale, you can't rule out a space-based system. 
I think that I I, <clears throat> I I think that that's a fair assessment. I think you could imagine um, if there were if a, a stratospheric system had disadvantages but advantages, and there were um, a way to retire it in favor of a space-based system. I can see why some people might want to do that. But again, I think the free driver problem would be, I mean, how much space-based would you want and how would you stop people from doing the aerosol stuff that you didn't like? Um, so uh, so that I, I am, I mean, it's clearly not um, a near-term goal. It's clearly not anything to do with hitting, with sort of like keeping under 1.5 or two. It might be a way as I say, it, you, one can imagine stories whereby it's a way of replacing a first generation of um, solar geoengineering with something further and more far out. Um, but that's, I think, the right way to see it rather than as an initial system. Um, Matt uh, had us on briefly to the topic of astropolitics. And uh, returning to that, uh, the, the all of uh, solar geoengineering is impossible to, manage, uh, to imagine structures by which we could govern it. And this is not different than other uh, solar geoengineering ideas in that regard, but maybe even more extreme. Do we imagine, um, again, that the OST does uh, provide a, a, a meaningful basis for governance? Uh, are there ways that we ought to be testing the OST to um, uh, uh, sort of make it more fit for purpose? Um, and do we imagine that the introduction of this issue uh, onto the world agenda will uh, help uh, the overall governance issues in the world? That th This is a, a goal around which the world can rally or uh, the, the Ukraine circumstance demonstrates to us how hard any global cooperation is, let alone so large a global cooperation as this one. Toss up for any of you. I'll start by maybe making the most optimistic end of the spectrum. So maybe we'll move quickly away from it. I guess one could imagine that something on the scale of the challenge of climate change and then a solution that works through space might have as good a chance as any kind of to bring the world together. I mean, if you look at the US-Russia relationship, the only place where there's even still any hope is on the ISS. Uh, and so, and you know, we've always thought of space as transcending those sorts of geopolitical um, battles. So I suppose, Wake, to your, I think where you were pushing us a little bit, perhaps there's some hope that this in a dire situation would be a place where we could all come together. I want to offer actually the same kind of optimism and really make it near term. So, so first of all, Wake, I want to push back a little bit on it's impossible to imagine any governance for solar energy. I can imagine tons of different governance arrangements. Many people have. You, they you all always have catch but, me up when I well, overphrase. But, so, but, you know, we, every <laughs> governance system has its weaknesses. But I think the key thing is that in thinking about the next steps on the 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 the, the play around solar geoengineering it might be that, that technological collaboration around space-based solar might be something that's pretty easy to get started because it's so obviously far away that it doesn't present a kind of near-term moral hazard. It's not as objectionable as collaborative funding for research on near-term aerosols. And there's some evidence to support that that really might be true. So there's actually significant amount of European interest in this uh, and, and, and um, more than I might've expected. And uh, a degree of internationalism around this uh, more than you might expect. So I think there might be a way, which really quite in the near term, you could imagine a, a collaboration on long-term research on space-based solar geoengineering between some major uh, space and uh, uh, and there's a second issue. Sorry, that space funding agencies are looking for a good mission to fund, have a lot of money, and need something to do. So I think the combination of the fact that the space agencies, to some extent, certainly NASA is looking for a mission. The fact that this is not as threatening as aerosol geoengineering and that it allows international cooperation, which there's a good tradition of in space, I think means you could imagine a near-term effort that might be important symbolically in getting um, dialogue and connections going on solar geoengineering, even if it actually produced nothing of technological interest in the near term. So I actually have some optimism about that. 
Oliver, are you going to I must say, given that I, 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 I think that's overly optimistic, um, given that um, sure. NASA is uh, quite capable of, um, well, it's not so much NASA. I mean, you talk about NASA wanting this, but you know, it's the people who fund NASA who are quite happy to spend $20 billion on a rocket that doesn't launch. Um, I don't think they need a noble goal in order to go on doing what, they, what they're doing. NASA is quite happy to run space missions that get as expensive as is required to keep everyone at JPL working. Um, so, you know, we now have $7 billion Mars sample return missions. Um, we have a $5 billion Europa Clipper. It's not like these guys need new excuses to spend money. Um, and I know that there is interest in European space circles in space solar geoengineering, because that's exactly the sort of thing that people who could become space enthusiasts want to do. There's really not any interest in European climate or policy circles, I think, in space-based solar geoengineering. Um, and uh, in case that I, I, I was, I was, I think, slightly mistaken as being over optimistic about the uh, outer space treaty i really wouldn't say that i am that um but i would say that the outer space treaty as a tool of governance exists and is not a dead treaty um yep. and there is nothing else in any similar area that is comparable I mean, the UN convention on the law of the sea obviously not very applicable to outer space or indeed the stratosphere isn't um, in, is, isn't ratified by the United States. The fact that you can't, that there are no better treaties than this one written in the 1960s that's never been really strongly tested is, you know, still makes it one of the best treaties. It doesn't, it really, really does strengthen one's distrust in the idea that better treaties will come along. I agree with all of that. And I think actually, maybe over to you in a second, Matt, but precisely as you said, some of the real tests of the treaty are just coming up with disputes about asteroid mining and so on. If the treaty survives those tests, if the structure of the treaty holds, then maybe it's an if then statement, then it provides at least a starting point for solar geo governance that's, that's unusual. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, it, I would just say it's it's also not just this that's a challenge that could bring folks together in space. I mean, space debris is obviously, you know, as all were referred to, Leo is a problem, has a problem with that already. And we're going to need some, well, we may need some intergovernmental cooperation to try to arrest that problem as well. So I think, yeah, as I said, space is one of those areas where we at least can hold out hope. Um, re limitations of research in respect of uh, stratospheric aerosol uh, injection are a topic that is discussed. Um, are there, what sort of limitations ought there to be, if any, in respect of uh, research on space-based uh, solar geoengineering? I think I can come down on a fairly heavy, not really any, uh, none here. I mean, because basically any space-based solar geoengineering research in anything like uh, the near term is basically solar sail research. And if there's one aspect of space flight that everyone finds lovely and poetic and who oh, isn't it all Arthur C. Clarke, then it's solar sail research. So I don't think there's any problem with that. I really, I mean, I really don't, uh, because I mean, it is, it is, uh, it is a really nice, clean environment to go out and do some physics in. Yeah, agreed, and there are a bunch of solar sail missions that are moving along. Uh, 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 wants to build booms for solar sails. There's a Planetary Society light sail too. There's a series of little missions that are inching along here, and. Um, one of the interesting questions is, does the community building those things start to market themselves as uh, playing in this space as well? And I'll um, also just say, oh, just quick building on that, you know, we, we talked a little bit about people needing missions. Uh, one of the big pots of money that just got uh, sent out from NASA was for commercial stations. They just spent $400 million giving grants to three companies to build them. One of the big questions with commercial stations is what are they gonna, like what's the demand for their use? Uh, and this, you know, this is potentially one of those places as well where uh, if the risks of spending some money to learn how we might do something like this 
are very low, that might be a good source of demand for the commercial station. Um, yeah, maybe Oliver, gonna... just, just, just one second. I think I want to slightly, so Oliver was right to, of course, right to say that uh, it's not as if the US Congress has any trouble commanding NASA to spend money to no effect. But there are political dynamics that threaten that, most obviously Starship and SpaceX. And so there may be, I think it's natural to think there's a political dynamic where there would be people in the NASA ecosystem, and maybe this is true at ESA, but I don't know that world politically so well, who would uh, look for other justifications to do the thing to be crass that they fundamentally need to do, which is make sure there's employment at those centers. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, David, I know that you have been monitoring the chat and also may have other thoughts on this. Is there one other um, aspect of this that you would want to steer us on to before we break off? And then Oliver, I'll ask you the same. Not offhand, I feel like I've monopolized the last minute. So over to Oliver or Matthew. I think in general, um, the problem with space-based uh, solutions has always been that the amount of work being done on Earth is so much greater. So, for example, if you take the much vaunted um, making perfect Christine crystals for protein crystallography in zero gravity, turns out that making way better X-ray sources uh, and learning tricks about crystallography on Earth completely knocks that for six. Um, and so the, the basic, the fact that so much more ingenuity is focused on Earth than uh, is focused on space will or is focusable in space, uh, I suppose I should say. Uh, it seems to me to be likely to to build a, a really structural problem there. And I can see that once that barrier gives way, then maybe it gives way in a big way. Um, but I also have a mind that was poisoned by science fiction when I was very young and rather pleasurably. And I know that I am... Um, more given to these things than I can rationally um, explain. <laughs> uh, Matt, closing thoughts? Oh, I will plead guilty to some of the same affliction as Oliver on the, on the hope for the hockey stick on how this will all develop. I think, of course, it's impossible to predict um, if that will end up happening. But uh, I suppose that just as we have a hope that the optimism, uh, we have an optimistic hope that we'll reach that point Given the context of what we're actually speaking about, it may become imperative that we start thinking extremely creatively about these solutions in a more pessimistic way. I want to follow your injunction, uh, Wake, to look at questions. I found there was a question there from Jay Apt, who knows a thing or two about space, it turns out. Um, and he says, can any participants make an argument that space-based astronaut could be deployed in a time scale that would make a difference and has a swipe at nuclear fusion? I think I'm prepared to make that case that if you believe, and some credible people do, that solar geo sort of starts around 2050 and that you're incrementally building it up at the rate of growth of radio forcing, I think that given where the space industry is moving now, I think you can construct a non-silly case that you'd be able to start building this thing in 2050, given that it's not like you want a 1% shield in 2050, but you want to start building one at a rate, I think you can easily construct a case that's doable. I'm not saying it's better than, than, than aerosols. I actually don't think there's a strong case for that, but it's a different thing with different politics and, and might have its own inertia. Fair enough. Well, the Energy Policy Seminar has a, um, a great track record of wrapping up on time. And so I'm gonna to try to keep to that. Uh, the next Energy Policy Seminar session is Monday, a week from today, April 11th. Um, Destiny Knock uh, will talk on energy limiting behavior, a hidden form of energy poverty. As regards the next session of the Solar Geo Policy Seminar, uh, that will be on April the 22nd under the title Indigenous Peoples and Solar Geoengineering. I thank everybody for uh, all of our panelists for uh, taking the time today and thank all of our audience members for joining. Um, uh, we look forward to seeing you next time around. Bye all. Thank you.